Today, we're introducing Neil Gaiman, who is a brilliant and incredibly imaginative writer. Um, we met notoriously when he was 15 and he came to interview me. This was long before you were born, Freya. Mm. <laughs> but yes. Um, I think you must have been my age. I must have. I think, yeah, I think I did the maths because Neil said he was 15. And I can't remember how old he is, but I did the maths and I think you would have been about my age, early 30s, something like that, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Probably, yeah, 32 or 33, yeah. Maybe even younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It's been a very long, long time. Anyway, that interview managed to get into an article he wrote. And he came with a friend. I can't remember if he came with one friend or two friends. In the interview, he said two. And one of his friends came to see me in an exhibition <clears throat> to explain that it was not his fault that the tape recorder ran out of battery. <laughs> It's, it seems to be something to do with you, though, doesn't it? Because uh, my friend Alex interviewed us for his podcast and his audio was absolutely shot to shizzle. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're blaming me? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, it seems to be some unfortunate curse of anyone who wants to get you on tape that it never quite <laughs> comes <laughs> off perfectly. <laughs> well... Yeah, we've mentioned, yes, two incidents. Um, yes, and actually what we should say is it worked this time, most importantly. <laughs> yes, it worked this time. And the thing that, um, actually, having said that he is a brilliant, brilliant writer and very imaginative writer, we talked a lot about that process of where ideas come and how important pathways and walking in the country, particularly um, a, a very isolated walk in the country. Mm. It's something actually um, that is gonna be very relevant to our next course, I think. Um, mm. One of the ideas that we were talking about was inspiration and where you get it. And I'm at the moment, you may have noticed my surroundings are a bit different. I'm in the I'm in the mountains at the moment. The lockdown in Japan finished. It's probably going to start up again. But I thought I'd take the opportunity to get out. And um, uh, me and my other half were going for a walk. And he had this idea for an art course um, to be an aspect of the one that we're doing. And he just started walking around and pointing out random things that look slightly strange and saying things like he found this seed pod with all these tendrils and he said forest octopus <laughs> and then he found this wall that had moss on it and he crouched down took a picture and he said hobbit pathway <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I saw this cut tree a cross section of a tree and inside it it looked like the silhouette of a baby and there's a story in Japan called Momotaro, which means peach taro, which is a boy's name. And it's about a boy who um, this old farmer cuts a huge peach in half and this little boy jumps out. And I thought maybe someone saw something like this cross section of a tree and got that idea. But it made me realize, like, if you kind of switch your mind off in a way, and like both of you were talking about, I loved the way that you were both talking about this. It made me kind of teary. Um, if you just sort of, it's like that thing where you half close your eyes. If you half close your mind <laughs> when you're walking in nature, yes. these things, these sort of uncanny. I mean, this was what I was. This was what I really loved about your conversation with Neil was the blurring between reality and mythology and unreality um was really nice throughout the whole conversation I thought and that obviously happens I guess when you have two people who create things out of nature you know you both see things there that maybe aren't necessarily there 
and make something new of it. Mm. Have you walked around the mountains? Because you, you said you were in the mountains, in the forest. Is, have you had a chance to walk around yet? Um, not hugely, but that's what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of days. Right. Is walking around and making some notes. I have to and say, I, I, it doesn't look like you're living in a rural cottage or in a tent. Well, oh. I told you to call me earlier so the sun would be up and you could see. <laughs> 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 there's trees and mountains out here there's snow on the mountains there's if you got me earlier there's people skiing outside my window <laughs> oh uh -huh. but nevertheless you look like you're very comfortable there i am really comfortable here well this is the thing about working for a company that has close ties with uh, hotel franchises <laughs> <laughs> right because I, I got the impression that um um when um Neil was staying on Sark, not Sark, what am I talking about, Sky. He was staying in a cottage. It was fairly rural. <laughs> Do you know what, That's, that brings me to something else I didn't know if I was gonna mention or not, but I thought it was really funny. Um, yes, so I'm not somewhere, you know, I'm not in a cabin in the woods by myself because, you know, I don't wanna end up in the news having disappeared. So I am staying in a hotel, um, but, I went to um, this museum, this art museum today. Another one of the things I was going to say about Neil and his writing, which I love, is it's that kind of writing that really makes you want to write. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like Angela Carter, I have the same thing, like reading her books. I really love and enjoy the process of reading them, but they always make me think, God, I've got to write something. This is just too much fun not to do myself. Um, but we went to see an artist called Raymond Peinet, and he's got a little gallery studio in the middle of the woods here. And he does these beautiful little illustrations of slightly poverty stricken couples living in ramshackle huts, but you know, their love sustains them. And I said to my other half, you know, in Japan is there this sort of romanticized idea of poor couples being sustained by their love for each other. And he just said, no, poor is poor. <laughs> <laughs> but that it just reminded me you saying that about Neil probably staying in some interesting you know stone cottage in the middle of the woods somewhere well ironically though in the middle of the country I don't think there is much in the way of forests and sky mm, right no yeah sort of heath and heather and rock and lichen yeah. Yeah. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. But I mean, you know, <laughs> he took me today. We did the whole run around of a supermarket, making sure I had like masks and breakfast food. And did I have the right phone charges? And did I know how to rent a bicycle in the morning? And so if if I'm freaking out that much about that kind of thing, a stone cottage in the middle of nowhere is probably going to be a bit of a trial for me. But you never know what you can get used to until you do it. And I'm sure, you know, creativity would be a flowing yeah. <laughs> under those circumstances. Yes. Yes. You need you need that opportunity to forget that human beings and all of their, you know, little irritations exist. You met Neil at Dave McKean's birthday party. Can you remember that? Yeah, I remember it really well. Um, he was so nice. And um, one of the reasons I re remember it really well is I got this fantastic photograph of you and he and Mike Lake sitting around a fire. And it looks like you're all sort of telling stories. Um, do you remember what you were talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I captioned it something, you know, properly, appropriately, you know, story-ish, like you're all sitting around the fire telling stories, but... It was, all re it was all reminiscing about events we shared and events we didn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was outside around a, a bonfire, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was really great. I think the first time I um, was introduced to Neil Gaiman or aware of him was actually in an episode of The Simpsons where they refer to him as British Fonzie. <laughs> <laughs> I see. We never covered that. <laughs> No, you didn't. You'll have to get him on again. That must be, I, I mean, like, that's got to be like a life highlight being Simpsonized, isn't it? <laughs> I guess. I guess, yeah. Because, you know, I always wondered, I loved The Simpsons, and I always wondered what I'd look like as a Simpson <laughs> if, you know, I'd been drawn like one of them. <laughs> well, you'd be very yellow. <laughs> I would. I would. And so would my hair, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, we're doing a very long intro to what is a nice and long conversation. Do you know what? I think we should just let it go this week and just like let the full conversations be what they are. Because it was, so, I mean, th there was one, th there's been a couple of other conversations you've had that made me feel like really like, gosh, yeah, this is what it's all about. And funnily enough, the other one was Dave McKean. And I think that was interesting that they work together. There's something like pretty exciting isn't there when two people who do really wonderful work and seem to have I don't know just when they talk about the creative process it feels really like oh yeah that's what it's about I think you can maybe maybe it's just me but like living in a big city working in a gallery working around lots of incredibly competitive and creative people you can sometimes forget how wonderful it is just to kind of be away and do your own thing and make something for the enjoyment of making it rather than hitting the next exhibition and doing the PR for it and making sure, you know, yeah. this and that happens. Yes, yes. So shall we, because it's a lovely interview and it's quite, I love the fact that it's so long. So shall we just cut straight to it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> this is Neil and Thank you, Neil, for joining us. It was brilliant. Okay, we're live. Well, not live, recording. I watched um, a talk you did to some university students graduating. I thought it was a brilliant chat. Oh. I, I love getting to do those kinds of things. Um, and I went into them feeling completely a fraud, having never actually gone to university. Um, and Perfect now, perspective, I would say. I, I, you know, that was actually, I mean, the most useful thing about that talk, I think, was probably it's like, okay, here's everything I know that's useful. This is everything I've learned distilled into about 16 minutes of talking and it's everything that got me through things um and i i i love i mean it's it's funny now that i'm old um i get to love universities i've been teaching at bard college in upstate new york for years now um and Having having the best time just interacting with with young people and going, you guys are the future. This is so cool. Well, yes. What I was hoping to talk to you about is the creative process and the future. But you just mentioned upstate New York. Are you still looking for the last time we talked? You were looking for a vase or something from the photograph of Bob Dylan's album cover. I was. I, I, that was my, my, my little project, which was an enormously wonderful project, um, to actually reconstruct everything on the album cover yeah. um, and just put it all back on that mantelpiece. And um, so the, the background on this for anybody who is watching this going, what on earth are they talking about? Um, is there is a Bob Dylan album called Bringing It All Back Home. Mm. And on the cover of that album, you have Bob Dylan sitting with a lady named Sally Grossman, who actually died two nights ago. 
um, oh my a God. message saying that she died, and uh, which made me very, very sad because we've been emailing and and uh, I was very much looking forward when the pandemic was over to getting back to upstate New York and seeing her again. Um, so they're sitting on a sofa and behind them is a fireplace and a mantelpiece and there are lots of things on the mantelpiece. And I bought the house that that photo was taken in, which was Sally Grossman's house. Albert Grossman was, was Bob's manager at the time. And uh, I bought the house from her. And then over the next year, I kept bumping into objects and I would go, hang on, you're, you're actually something that was just on that mantelpiece because Sally had left a lot of her stuff behind. Anything she didn't want, she just left behind. So I found the painting and I put that back up and I found this strange puppet and I put that up and I went and found the exact right candlesticks and then went, well, hang on, I can, I, I, we have the Lord Buckley album. I'll go and put that Lord Buckley album up. And, uh, and so I was in the process of, of putting everything back together on there and uh, more or less did it, I think fairly successfully. And at some point in there, my wife recorded an album with her father um, as a, just a lovely sort of thing. And they, they included, um, it was all cover album, cover tracks. And one thing that I loved about that was they decided, well, they do make the album cover a cover and they covered bringing it all back home as a cover. So you can see my, my mantelpiece behind them, my reconstructed mantelpiece. That's brilliant. I mean, we're both getting on, but me more so than you. But you once said one of your first jobs was to interview me. It was, and it was, I love the fact that you and I have spoken in the flesh now twice, once, oh, three times actually, because there was, there was uh, we, we said hello at some Titan thing or other. No, we went um, to Dave McKean's. But, but I was going to say, Dave McKean's 50th birthday was where we actually got to meet and chat and, and catch up. Yeah. And, um, but I'd met you before when I was 15. And um, through a series, there was a magazine, uh, which one issue of which actually came out called Metro. These days, there is a much more famous magazine called Metro, but we named our fanzine Metro because it sounded, this was 1976, uh, named it Metro because it sounded likely. It sounded like the kind of magazine you'd probably heard of, that there, there ought to be something called Metro. Indeed. And uh, we did interviews and it was from interviewing you that I learned the lesson that actually carried me through my 20s when I was a journalist and interviewing people professionally. And I was just glad that I learned it young and learned it the hard, 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 hard way. Um, because I remember we, we came to Brighton, um, I think we were in Croydon, so we probably got the train down and then probably the bus because we were 15 and didn't do exciting things like taxis. Um, and I remember you're, you, had, you had a pod in the garden, in the front garden. Kind of, we did. Um, we did. And, and I remember some of, some of those amazing um, paintings just sort of propped up against walls. Um, well, it I was think just you're like, being oh, very everything was real. Because I thought in your article, you wrote about the cobwebs, not the paintings. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was definitely a little dust on, the, um, on, on, on some of the paintings, but I loved, I, what I was excited by was the paintings. But what, what was the, the thing that broke my heart, but also was amazing was we sat and we talked to you. You were incredibly courteous. You were wonderful and you gave us the best interview. And when we left, we played back 
the interview. And uh, the first two minutes of us talking was there perfectly. And then you started speeding up and talking like Mickey Mouse, and then you stopped. <laughs> and the batteries on our cassette recorder had run down. Oh. And that for me was, it was a sort of enormous lesson. I, as, as a professional interviewer, uh, when I was in my twenties, I had batteries, spare batteries, spare tapes. And at the, from the moment I could afford it, a spare cassette recorder, micro cassette oh. recorder as well. Um, but mostly what I, what I remembered was your, I, you know, from you and also from Michael Moorcock, who we also interviewed at the time, um, was the kindness and the, you might have blinked once or twice at the arrival of three boys in school uniforms interviewing you. Was it but three? then you treat, I thought it was, it was either two, uh, might have been. Um, it was me, Dave Dixon, and Steve Gett, and there might have been a photographer. Um, ah, it's a long time ago. Um, but what I mostly remember was just the incredible respect and kindness that you showed us. And you Thank treated God, us Well, we would have as... a difficult time today. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it was, it was great. And, and that in terms of lessons that you learn, um, when I was an interviewer in my 20s, I kept discovering the same thing over and over again, which was the people who were actually in the first division, however you want to define the first division, the people who were on top of the game, the people who were in the forefront of whatever it was that they did were lovely. There was no side to them. They were always, interested, helpful, and fantastic. The third division and the bottom of the second division, and sometimes even the top of the second division, was where the monsters lived. Nice. And they were the people who would, who would you actually use things like, don't you know who I am, unselfconsciously. They were the people who would make you jump through the hoops in order to talk to them. They were the people who would make your life miserable and then read the, you know, insist on approval over the thing that you'd written and when you give it to them grudgingly because they haven't had an article about them in two years, but you really like their work and you want to give it to them. They're, suddenly their agent is phoning you up with changes that they want made and you're going, I now understand why nobody ever writes to you, <laughs> writes about you. Um, it was, it was that thing of just realizing that the people at the top of their game tended to be big hearted, helpful, and interested in other people. Bless you and thank you. Your colleague, Dave, I think it was, I, I hope I've got his name right, came yes. to one of my exhibitions and said it wasn't his fault. <laughs> <laughs> The battery I, I love I love the fact that you've got you know we went on to have these amazing careers I you know have awards up the yin yang and and all of that kind of stuff Dave Dixon wonderful guy went on he was the most interesting interviewer on Kerrang for years he did all of the bands but all of the other you know and I love the fact that it still rankles <laughs> that. <laughs> that interview is kind of apocryphal. <laughs> well, let me run a little anecdote by you. Um, and I because I'm imagining this happens to you all the time. In the early part of my career, people used to say to me, where do you get your ideas from? And I used to think that was an unanswerable question and I never gave it any attention. Until one day I was doing, talking about doing an album cover for a guy called Ramesses. And he came up with the idea for the cover. It's one of the only ones I ever did with somebody else's idea, because I liked it. Anyway, we were talking and he apologized and said, 
he promised to do an interview with NME or some one of those. And the guy from NME joined us for 20 minutes. And his first question to Ramesses was, where do you get your ideas from? And Ramesses said, well, um, when I'm sitting quietly like this, they come from over here. And we all cracked up. But you know what? I, I knew there was a profound truth in that. That is how it worked. You know, you, you, when, when you're ready, they come. And I really wanted to see what your experience was. In my experience, most ideas come when you're doing something else. Yes. Especially if you're, I mean, in my case as a writer, if I'm writing something else and I'm actually in the zone, I'm in the place where I'm making connections, I'm putting together um, words, but I'm also putting together concepts and I'm putting together characters and I'm building and I'm doing that thing. That's when I get ideas I cannot use because I'm doing something, I'm busy and I have to sort of take them and put them over there and How do you do that? Hope. Um, very often I'll grab my phone and record them and dictate. Okay. And I'm also these days using the Google Keep app more and more where yeah. it's just a little app, it's just a little app that it seems to it's on everything I have and it's very very simple and things seem it seems very good at keeping things so I, I will type things or actually just dictate things into there. But I remember I, I was exactly like you in that I thought it was unanswerable to begin with. So I would make fun of people who asked me. Yes. You know, if, if they said, where do you get your ideas from? I'd say, ha ha ha, a little shop or whatever. I'd, I'd be yeah. idea of the month club. Um, and then I was at my daughter's school and there were a bunch of seven year olds and I had to go in and give a talk to a bunch of seven-year-olds about being a writer. And one of them said, where do you get your ideas from? And I thought, you can't make fun of a seven-year-old for asking that question. And then I thought a little bit more, and I thought, actually, the reason we make fun of people who ask us that question is not because it's a stupid question. It's not because it's a bad question. It's because in some ways it's the only important question. It is huge. It's such an important question. Yeah. And we don't really know the answer to it. So it's so much easier just to go, ah, you just asked me where I get my ideas from. What a silly question. And, and but now I'm confronted by seven-year-olds. So I, I remember trying to say to them, okay, let's, I think the biggest place you get your ideas from is confluence. It's sort of daydreaming and it's, things coming together. It's things that you already knew coming together in patterns that they didn't exist in before. Yeah. And sometimes that can be the smallest kind of pattern. Um, and sometimes it's just asking yourself questions. A lot of it is the mechanics of daydreaming. Well, you know, I, Sorry. No. I was going to say, you know, when you're daydreaming, your brain is working much harder than if you're doing some really intense, equal, intellectually challenging exercise. And the reason they know I that is your brain generates 30% more heat when you're daydreaming than if you're trying to do the example I often give is an equilateral, equa sorry, quadratic equation. You're doing a quadratic equation it's 30 percent cooler than if you're just daydreaming i love that and that fe that feels right because it kind of feels like daydreaming is a wonderful kind of state to be in it's that place where you'd be in as a kid looking at a window with rain on it and yes. watching the drips and starting to think about 
whether any of these drips had personalities and what their lives were like and who was going to get to the bottom of the window first and um, why don't they go straight why yes they why are they wiggling <laughs> and you just sort of watching and thinking and it's in that place it's when you sort of let go that much for me yeah that the ideas turn up and you ask yourself a what if um occasionally um you know i i i, I learned that i could sometimes get ideas just while exercising again but what was important wasn't so much the exercise what was important was that i wasn't thinking i if i i go for a jog and so I've gone for a half hour jog. The first 15 minutes of that jog is me chewing over the events of the day, being upset about what I'm upset about, positive, figuring out solutions to problems, things I need to sort out and all of that kind of stuff. And then 15 minutes in, I'm exhausted and I've already thought about all that stuff. And all of a sudden I'm just, just running and yeah. looking at the trees and looking at the road and breathing and that's the point where I suddenly go, oh, in my novel that I'm working on right now, the next thing that needs to happen is this. I find walking on pathways, I find pathways, I've described them as like a, a prayer in landscape, but they're definitely like a meditative process. You know, that going around and under and over and the body just engaging and the mind being free. It's just passing the responsibility. I love that. I love that aspect of walking. I, I keep thinking more and more these days because I, I was, uh, I'm currently in New Zealand, but I spent most of lockdown on the Isle of Skye. And I was, um, I would walk every day and I wound up with this sort of, ever deepening relationship with the rocks yeah. that I would pass. And one reason I was, it was a fascinating relationship was I started realizing that all of these rocks um, were there because somebody had put them there. And somebody had put them there at some point in the last eight, 9,000 years. Yeah. And you know, here's this arrangement of three rocks over here. And here's something that used to be a little Viking village and I would walk and thinking a lot about the earliest rocks that I would come across. And the earliest rocks were from people who were turning up probably about 12,000 years ago, right at the, you know, as very, the very, left. very early as the ice left and they were coming down probably getting collecting the ochre and going off again and then and thinking okay well who were these people and what did they think about and just the accretion for me of all of the things that I would ponder about the walking and the nomadic humans and what happens at the point where they decide to stay in this valley and what happens when here they are, they're now, we're now in the Mesolithic and now we're in the Neolithic and now they're making stone circles. Here's an old stone circle that they made and uh, trying to put oneself into their shoes, but also trying to figure out what their thought processes were. You can't and walk that, that without thinking like that, can you? You can't because that landscape, the, the landscape, you, you know that landscape is the same landscape they were seeing 12,000 years ago um, and 6,000 years ago and 1,000 years ago. And you also know that um, the, the things they did that changed the landscape are still there. I, I was walking at one point with an archaeologist having a socially distanced walk with him near my house. And he was saying, you know, the funny thing about this area is you'd expect a 
you'd expect to have had a Viking village or something here. We've never, um, we've never seen one. There's no evidence that there is one. And I said, yeah, I, that, that is strange. And then we decided to take a shortcut to the top of a hill on a route that we'd never taken before. And uh, we, we go up this hill and suddenly we're on a little flat bit we hadn't known was there. And he looks down and he says, that's a Viking longhouse. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, that, this is a longhouse. And he explained to me the dimensions of it and why it was on a hill going down. And um, the, um, the, 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 um, and, you know, I went back, light was going, and I went back the next day and realized there was an entire village. Yeah. Um, and I loved just going, okay, and, and of course this, and I, when you're standing there and you're going, this is the view that they had, of course, they put their village here. This is, you've got this view, you can see this and this, and you're protected. And the Neolithic guys would have had their um, they would have been over here because what would have been important to them is the signal fires. What would have been important to them is signaling that raiders were coming, signaling that danger was coming. So they would have needed to be able to see that point and then they could have been seen by that. The Vikings don't actually care about that. What they want to do, they're not into signal fires. They're just into, is anybody coming into the bay by boat? You can yeah. see everything from here. Um, and all of that will probably turn into, I don't know, a novella, a novel, something at some point. Oh, that's um, but and, and mostly what I now chew over is not so much what happens, just as trying to figure out the structure. And what is the structure of trying to mm. tell a story that's 12,000 years long, bounded by stones? and where the people are going to come and go, but the stones are going to be sighting, uh, consistent. Sighting pathways and sighting villages. Do you know the landscape a little bit to the northeast of there, between Sil Sylvan, Quinaig, and Loch Inver? Mm -hmm. it's, um, it, that was one of my favorite landscapes because it's almost entirely in miniature. There's lakes, that are about 10 foot across. And there's little yeah. forests where silver birch that are ancient and no more than four foot tall. And it's just, you know, the original bonsai were in fact silver birch from the mountains in Japan. They, they had grown naturally stunted, super stunted. And they were, I, they were gorgeous. I didn't know that, but in, in, the, in a little town called Uig, there's a place called the Fairy Glen on Sky, and it is exactly that. It has a huge, enormous loch that is maybe 20 feet across, 30 feet across. It has mountains, and they are mountains, and they are giant hills. Yes. But they're maybe 20 feet high. But everything is in proportion. Everything That's in the it, Fairy Glen yes. is just shrunk. So you walk across, and you feel you know you, you feel a hundred feet tall ancient gnarled forests of heather <laughs> yes it's so have true. you come across the book by nan shepherd who wrote about the cairngorms and robert um oh what's his name my mind is terrible the treacherous Robert McFarlane. I haven't, but I'm writing them down. Yeah, you would love them. He writes wonderful books about walking and pathways. And she wrote about walking and the Cairngorms, and he wrote the introduction to her book. I mean, the Coolan were my favorite mountains I never got to. I climbed pretty much all over Scotland walking mostly, I shouldn't say climbing, walking to the tops again yeah. and again and again, but not, not doing the difficult climbing. But, that, but I loved it. I just love that landscape. And it, the fact that the rabbits and the sheep had cropped the grass so short, everything was in scale. It was all miniature. 
I, I've always loved, one of the things I love about your work is the ability to always make, to communicate your enthusiasm for, land, for landscape by, and sometimes that's done by adding something surreal to the landscape, whether it's you know, a giant snake or, or the fact that the landscape is free floating unmoored from the world but the the enthusiasm and the delight that you take in in the shapes of the natural world and what you see and then how it transmutes um i think is, is one of the things that's always delighted me in your work thank you guys sir yes well scotland was the origins for most of it the Close to the edge painting was actually the Lake District, and there was a mountain there called the Hast called Haystacks. And on the top of it, on the top of this mountain, was a tarn. Not very big, but you know, mm -hmm. what on earth was it doing there? <laughs> it was there. It was it was and it was permanent. It wasn't like only there when it rained. It was there all the time. And it was just not crazy. I, I love look I love the moments where landscape itself becomes surreal. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to be anywhere fancy. I was once, I mean, a, a, something that will one day make it into a story because how could I not? Um, and it's just sitting, floating in my head, waiting for the right story to go into, was I was writing the graveyard book. I was in a tiny cottage that I'd rented in those pre-Airbnb days um in Cornwall mm. and up on some hills and I was writing there I go for a walk every morning and one morning I went for a walk and the mists had come up and the mists had turned had come up like the sea yeah. and they were thick and suddenly you were getting islands all around me every hilltop had yeah. become an island in a sea of mist. And the world was not real. And I was standing there in this not real world going, this is, this will pass in, you know, in an hour, in half an hour, in 20 minutes, the mist will burn off. But right now I can see that island over there and that island over there. And I'm in this archipelago that feels like the archipelago of dreams. Yes, it's true, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, I've rarely walked in Scotland when there hasn't been at least one event of that kind of spookiness. Double, uh, that, that, you know, I mean, the great thing about Sky in particular is if you don't like the weather, you just have to wait another half hour and it will do something <laughs> even less likely. Yeah. Um, and so not only are you going to have rain, I've watched rain come down go across and then go up again as the wind caught it. Um, I've watched skies filled with rainbows. I, When I was on sky, the thing that used to frustrate me is I'd have my camera and I was determined to try and capture somehow the quality of the light you'd get when the sun shone and it was raining. And there's an amazing, it feels artificial. The light suddenly feels like it's somebody, uh, you know, there's, there's somebody with giant movie camera, uh, you know, movie studio lights illuminating the set you're on. Um, and I never managed to get that light. They, in Japan, I believe they call it the Fox's Wedding. Wow. Well, they're good at poetry, aren't they? <laughs> they really are. I saw a lovely film about Hokkaido and about um, there was a, a village and they were the fishermen were there and um, a bear came along and they said how they would initially 20 years ago were very afraid when the bears turned up but they've come to a kind of a agreement with the bears they don't tear the nets but they can have the odd fish you know, it's, and there they were, and there were there were people, and there was a bear, and then a few minutes later, some deer came, 
had a drink in the river and went off and then a fox came and joined in. And I thought, you know, a culture that's that at ease with these creatures is amazing. In that same program, they had um, a temple dedicated to deer and they sold deer snacks and the deers mm -hmm. came out of the mountains every morning to, to feed, be fed by the tourists. And if the tourist was a bit tardy with handing out the deer biscuits, they'd butt them with their heads. And I thought, this was fantastic. It was just, yeah. I've never been to Hokkaido, but that is on my list. Freya's living in Tokyo now. I, I'll have to get her to fix that. You have to, as soon as the world opens up and we travel again. Yeah. But you have all those landscapes, all and more, where you are now, don't you? I do. I'm, I'm, I'm on an island in New Zealand, and I've been looking at... Um, right now looking at going, okay, Ash, my son, who's five, it's his school holiday at the end of the month, end of April, so I've got two weeks. Where am I, where am I gonna go in New Zealand? What am I gonna do? Where am I gonna take him? And uh, so fascinated because it, it's like actually going, this is one of the most beautiful places. It has all sorts of unlikely things. There are some parts of it that I always thought were imaginary. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was obsessed by a poem by Edward Lear um, about the Yonghi Bongi Bo, which began on the coast of Coromandel, where the early pumpkins blow in the middle of the woods lived the Yonghi Bongi Bo, and uh, the courtship of the Yonghi Bongi Bo, it's called. And... Um, discovering that the incredibly beautiful peninsula that I can see uh, when I go down to the beach and look out is the coast of Coromandel has excited me no end. And so I'm determined to go and visit Coromandel and have it move from being a fictional place when I was five to being a real place now. And, and that's in New Zealand. That's in New Zealand. It's I don't think the Yonghi Bongi Bo exists, but, uh, but they do have, I, I saw they have a, a beach uh, where there are hot springs flowing underneath the beach. So people, as the tide goes out, uh, dig in the sand with spades that they can rent or have brought. <laughs> and, uh, and it fills up with hot water and they, they <laughs> go into their hot water holes. I'm like, how unlikely is that? How glorious. Yes. But you know, quicksand, quicksand is literally ordinary sand with water coming up through it. I spent, I have to say, becoming an adult has mostly been really fun. I've enjoyed the, the amount of power that you get as an adult, the amount of autonomy you get. Um, but I do look back on what I learned from the media as a child and the things that I thought were going to be problems when I was an adult that have not proved to be problems. And quicksand, I think, is chief amongst those because in, it, it seemed like, you know, in every movie you watch, every children's TV show, there would be a sign saying quicksand that people would miss, or they'd be, you know, they suddenly have to rescue each other from the quicksand. And I'm like, right, when I grow up, I'm definitely going to be, have to know how to do quicksand. And I, and I learned the technique for quicksand, which is apparently you're meant to spread yourself out flat swim. and, and swim slowly through it and not stand up, but you, you, and, and, so far, no quicksand. I'm I'm 60 years old. <laughs> zero quicksand. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I thought it was going to be daily. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I remember reading reading these books with names like there, there was a little red book called I think Survival, which was the U.S. Air Force manual 
that went out to every, uh, every everyone in the Air Force, and I picked up a copy secondhand in a little bookshop in Croydon, plus books, I think. And it had instructions for how you survive on desert islands, in the Arctic, um, you know, in the in deserts. It just gave you survival instructions and what, what you could eat, what you couldn't, how to... And I, as far as I was concerned, this was my manual because obviously at some point I would be stranded in a jungle or a desert. Um, and I'd need to know how to survive. Yes. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, I've been reading a book about Tolkien and Wagner. And for some people, it's a huge controversy was Tolkien influenced by Wagner. And some people say Tolkien got it from the same original source, but clearly he didn't. He got some of it from Wagner, but it doesn't seem to matter because he did something entirely different with it. But you had a shot at the Norse gods, didn't you? I did. I loved the Norse gods. I mean, obviously, Wagner went and found things in Norse mythology and used them to construct the, the ring cycle. Um, I, I love Norse mythology. I loved Norse mythology when I was a kid. Um, I loved it in a completely different way, rediscovering it in my 20s and 30s and realizing that the stuff that I'd read was the kind of slightly cleaned up version. Yeah. Um, and I loved when I was offered the opportunity to retell these stories. I, I jumped at it. I jumped at it much more slowly than I should have done because it actually took me about eight years to do the book, which was not a long book. And the first two or three years um, more, the first, first four years, I think, um, I spent just trying to work out what the voice of the book would be. Yeah. I knew, I knew that I, it's a weird kind of thing because the stuff, the writing can go very fast. It's the intangibles sometimes that, that I slow up on. And in that case, I wanted a, to figure out how I was doing this, what this was gonna be. And eventually I thought, okay, it's a storytelling voice. And the storytelling voice I want to adopt is just the idea, it's like, where am I standing on these stories? And I thought, what I'm really standing is just the idea that you are going from place to place in Scandinavia, um, they have big meeting halls where everybody gets together in the winter. Um, and you've come into town and you're being feasted and you have to tell a story. And your payment and, you know, people, we crave entertainment. Human beings are a kind of very strange animal that loves a very strange kind of entertainment, but we, we, we will build stories in our heads by being told stories. If you tell us a story, we will then take your words. We take the sounds, turn them into words, take the words and turn them into people and turn them into landscapes and turn them into events. Um, and those stories were the currency of humanity the most important thing, the thing that would have got you in terms of meeting people from other places. The reason why I get 
slightly impatient with the theories that all stories, no stories ever originated anywhere. All stories are just variants of other stories and so on and so forth, is that I go, well, actually, you know, it seems to me the reason why a lot of these stories show up in a lot of places is because people traveled and people yeah. told each other these stories. Um, Vikings. Especially. There was a wonderful, there was an amazing article in the, um, the Guardian over a decade ago now that I'm still fascinated with because it presented a world that I wasn't used to. And the article said that um, until now, they've been doing metallurgic analyses of Viking swords that Vikings were buried with. You know, if you're buried, ship, ship funeral, or whatever, and they've covered you with earth and you've got your sword there, and they examine the sword. And they'd also started looking at the swords that people fell in battle with um, in, in swamps and, and such when you've been sucked down and you've fallen and you're there mummified in some bog with a sword. Right, in some and of those swamps, if there's no oxygen, which there often isn't, they don't rust. Exactly. Yeah. So they could, um, they could actually do some metallurgy analyses. And what they learned was people got buried with the second best sword. They got buried with the spare sword, mm. uh, which had normally been made locally. But the good sword, you don't get buried with, that goes to your son or whatever. But the people who fell in battle had the good swords. I'll just ignore that, sorry. And the good swords um, came, they, they, they could analyze them to figure out where the metal came from. And they're like, oh, this is really interesting. Really good Viking swords came from Afghanistan. Uh, uh, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, it's in the Guardian. And oh, I love that. I love that idea. The just because it opens, you start thinking about trade routes. Yeah. You start thinking about people traveling. You start thinking about um, things, objects. You know, you know, we know about the Silk Road. We know about the spice trading, but but ah, oh, okay, here's here's blade trading, and these blades are going to wind up in Norway. And in Sweden, it's not impossible. Start out Afghanistan. Didn't get there though. They may have actually got absolutely. Them. Well, we know. I, I mean, I, you know, one of one of my favorite Viking sagas is the Orkney Inga saga, and halfway through the Orkney Inga saga, which is just the the history of Orkneys, uh, history of Orkney, um, there's a point where um, Duke Rangvald, is it? Um, decides that they should all nip off to the Holy Land and ships get three ships get get built, takes them a few years and then they get in the boats and they go south and they have an adventure in Spain and they have an adventure with pirates in the Mediterranean. Uh, my favorite bit is when they set light to the pirate ship and much to the upset of the pirates, and they watch all of the melted gold coming out of the pirate ship as it burns, and they realize that the pirates had hidden all their treasures um, in, in the walls of the ship. Um, and they eventually, they get to the Holy Land, and they do the Viking equivalent of buy some souvenir ashtrays and tourist tat, and then they go home again. Well, and they, they also stayed because the cosmopolitan of Constantinople, he had essentially a Viking honor guard, Axeman. Absolutely. I, I love that. 
I love, I love, I mean, there's stuff earlier than that, which is just as weird. The idea that in Turkey, at one point in there, you had a sort of quite possibly British Celtic um, tribe, uh, you know, they sort of all moved with their Celtdom. Yes. And uh, that was, so you had the Celts of Brittany and you had the Celts of Wales and of Scotland and of, and of Turkey. And Apparently like, people are not 100% sure who they were. There's so much stuff we can't know. But the Turks. And there's so much stuff that. They only turned up about 900. So, yep. Yeah. And they, of course, I mean, it's, it's weird because history, history always keeps rolling. Um, right now, the Uyghur people are in the news and, you know, the, the suppression of the Uyghurs, the possible attempted genocide by the Chinese of the Uyghurs is a huge thing. Um, but when I was in Xinjiang province in 2008, I was talking, uh, which was before the Uyghurs were being persecuted, I was talking to some Uyghur people who were explaining that their grandparents um, met some Turkish people and they could understand each other. And the idea that the Uyghurs as a Turkic language that this was once you know a Turkestan and you had a people who had spread all the way from what's now western China all the way to Turkey and they could understand each other they could talk. Freya and I were in Turkey with some friends who were Japanese and the Turkish people didn't really get that they were Japanese they just called them you are the original Turks, <laughs> thinking they were from Mongolia and China. Yep. It's I, the, the, we don't, I mean, I love the fact that we, we don't understand people. We don't understand history. Um, and we don't understand history because the history that actually happened, A, is not the history that we've been taught and B, we lost so much. There's information we don't have. Mm. And occasionally you'll get these little um, revelations that come from something like DNA and you go, ah, oh, okay, the original people and in the UK were, were brown skinned and blue eyed. Um, the stig of the dump people. That's what they would have looked like. They, they weren't white skinned at all. That mutation hadn't yet turned up and spread. Can I ask you, were you not tempted to make a giant Norse saga a la The Rings, both of them? I think that I was lucky in that I got to do my giant saga when I was young. Um, Sandman was 3000 pages long in terms of comics and given that there were four thousand four pages to each page of comics in terms of script it was twelve thousand pages of writing um and i got to tell a giant huge serialized saga that is big and it's heavy um and since then I felt like I'd done that. I love doing things. I love telling stories. But I also, there was a weird kind of stress. I must say when I read it, I did want more. Good. You should always want more. But <laughs> I, I, I feel very, you know, my heart bleeds for George R. R. Martin because I, when, when doing Sandman, I knew that if I got hit by a car, that was that was where this thing finished. <laughs> I mean, George has had a kind of weird upside down thing in that, you know, the, the, the plot of his story has now been told on television and now he's still writing his books. But 
it, there was very much that feeling when I was doing Sandman of, I'm the only one who knows what happens. This is my story. I'm telling it my way. And it's an awful responsibility. You know, you have to sort of feel like you have to keep yourself alive and keep telling the story until it's done. And unlike a normal book, it was published before you, it was finished. Exactly. Um, because that was the nature of comics. Uh, you know, the, the weird, wonderful oddness of it all is that you're, you can't do the thing that you become very used to doing in novels where you need the gun in the desk drawer in chapter 12. So you just go back to chapter one and you have him open the desk drawer and notice the gun and put it away just so that it's ready for you and nobody thinks you just made that up. They think you knew about <laughs> that all the time. And you didn't, you made it up, but then you went back and you made it credible. Um, but of course, in Sandman, I could never do that because, you know, the, the comic was already on the stands. It had been bought. People had, they, they'd seen that that desk drawer was empty. So you couldn't do that, but you could do things that, when, when I read Dickens um, oh, as an adult, I, oh, I, I, fa I found myself recognizing some of the things he did because I would go, okay, you are part of the overall plot. You are something that exists in order to have two things that are part of the overall plot bumped together and you need a scene between them. So you're just making that bit up. This is something you know that you can, you'll use probably, but you're not sure what it's for yet. You're just sort of building you're building a little structure here that you just go, okay, I think I'm going to need one of these. And I don't really know what it's for. And sometimes some of those structures that you build do not get used. And you can, it's a, a really interesting phenomenon with Dickens. You can actually go through and go, oh, I can watch you building. Oh, nobody ever comes back to that. Well, we had a whole plot. You were meant to be meeting somebody on a bridge that night and having a conversation, but then the plot went off in another direction and we've apparently forgotten. Yes. The, um, the meeting on the bridge never happens and it never gets alluded to again. It's like uh, so, polar journeys, isn't it? Where you put a cache of food for the return. Exactly. Trip. You put it out because you'll need it. And you know you'll need it. You're just not quite sure what it's for. And sometimes you may not need it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you might have forgotten you know, which I think is also perfectly possible. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a point at the end of, as we head toward the end of the Pickwick Papers, as you can see him just sort of going, ah, oh, okay, I've got all of these plot threads rolling and I need to try and tie them all up. And um, it, it, but the point for me was just going, okay, you can't, in a world in which you cannot rewrite, you have to create in another way. And it's also in some ways, very much like the way that people make television these days, serialized drama, where there are things you do not know. And one of those things is simply, you don't know when a character, the combination, of an actor and a character is gonna make magic. And you're gonna to want to keep that character around. You're gonna to wanna to see them again. Yes. You know, I, I love the fact that Jesse was meant to have died at the end of season one of Breaking Bad. Um, but there was a writer's strike, so they stopped. And by the time the writer's strike was over, um, everybody knew that they loved Jesse and the combination of Walt and Jesse was where the heart of the show appeared to be. And nobody in their right minds was gonna kill off Jesse now. <laughs> right. But real life can be like that. I, I've just been through the process this week of being involved in the formation of a company where a product is launched tomorrow and we never did anything. We haven't 
registered the company, we haven't formed a bank account, we haven't done any of those things. And it's all done on the fly, partly mm -hmm. because we were given the equivalent of a publication window. If we didn't hit, we may not get one for months or years. So we decided, okay, we're going to go for it. But it did mean awesome. everything was up in the air. All those empty drawers, <laughs> we're going back and putting the stuff in. <laughs> I was thinking about you um, three days ago, three or four days ago, we had to go into Auckland to get Ash, my son, uh, his, his passport needed renewing. So we went and renewed his passport and then we went to a record shop and I bought my first um, actual proper piles of LPs uh, that I bought I don't know, in, in many, many years, uh, we got a record player and Amanda and I just walked around going, Playing neither of us have actually really been shopping for a year. Um, let's just buy some LPs. So we've got the ones that we loved. And I was bringing them home, looking at the covers, looking at these things as objects and feeling almost cheated for the generation, the CD generation, and then the your music doesn't even exist. It's a virtual yeah. thing that has no pictures generation yeah. because these things are beautiful and they're big and you can hold them and you can you can puzzle over them. You can try and find clues to the music in them. You can make a gift of them. Exactly. And it, do you know what? It lasted maybe 25 years. Before that, it was very hard to give someone a gift of music. Then you had that incredible, wondrous, but brief period when whether you were buying it for yourself or somebody else, it was like a serious, seriously desirable object. And, and then it went away. Yeah. And, and I remember how happy we were all very, or I, you probably weren't, but I was, I was thrilled when CDs happened because they were small, they were compact. You didn't have to keep getting up and changing them, turning them over. They seemed so much better. And, and you yet, them in the car. You could play them in the car. You could do a thing where I used to love, um, I had a, a six CD changer and I would put my six CDs in it and decide that morning what my six CDs were gonna be. And then I press random. And now I was listening all day to a radio station I'd created myself. Six hours of music was gonna be happening and I wouldn't know what was coming next. And it was exciting. Um, but in all that, the, the wonderfulness of this thing as an object had gone away. Mm. The, and the art had gone away. And just looking at, you know, because one of the things we were doing is just both of us were buying beloved albums again for the first time. Um, in, uh, we have a record player and we have a small son who now can work the record player. So, and is very bossy about what goes on. Uh, his favorite thing is the Grease soundtrack. Um, but, oh, wow. you know, we get to slip in and put on our own music as well. Um, and uh, it just, but I loved thinking about what those things were. I love the fact that, you know, when you did the album cover album books, um, you remember the celeb. Absolutely. I, I mean, they were they were such a celebration of what yeah. was created. Um, in retrospect, in hindsight, they're practically an epitaph. Um, Sadly, at yeah. least, you know, to, to a glory day, to something magical we, and beautiful. The last one we never published, which would have been volume seven. We did publish, publish volume six. But volume six was right up until the, you know, CDs were everywhere. And the tragedy of CDs 
is they were so poorly packaged. It wasn't the size that was a disappointment because the Japanese just created miniature albums and they were exquisite. But yeah. the jewel box was so tacky and so unlike a jewel. <laughs> the, the cheapness of them meant you couldn't, a CD was not a satisfactory gift. It wasn't. And you never knew how to give them to people. And also different places had different sort of CD standards. You go to America and your CD was in a long box, a long cardboard box designed to be 12 inches high this, so that they could reuse their old album um the lp shelves and the record yes. bin and which also was this sort of strangely wasteful packaging because then you would have because to it was rip open designed to be destroyed yeah which the album cover was not it was part of the thing permanently meant to be a permanent part but those packages were meant to be destroyed it was a terrible notion on the other hand, I do love the fact that art that was created for albums wound up in more hands and under more eyes than, than would have gone to any art galleries, than would have gone to any museums. I, I am one of the generation who discovered Richard Dad through the Queen album because there it was, you opened the fairy fellas, you opened Queen 2, I think it was, and there was the fairy fellas masterstroke reproduced in the middle of it. Um, and he didn't do many, did he? <laughs> he didn't. Um, they were amazing. That, that, but that, that kind of, um, you know, art became incredibly democratized. <clears throat> It inter yes, and if you're going there with a lot of bands, Genesis, yes, as well as Queen, it didn't only introduce people to the visual arts, it introduced them to a much wider spectrum of music than rock and roll. It yeah. was amazing. It, it, well, the concept of an album as well, just as this, uh, and the concept of a concept album. Yeah. Um, and I remember having my copy of The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Yeah. Circa, what, 74, 75? And Storm. listening to it over and over again. Mm. Um, just trying to tease out the story. It felt like Peter Gabriel had a story and I didn't quite know what it was, but it felt like your job as the listener was to keep listening until the thing revealed itself. Um, there is a notion sometimes about art, not just visual art, but art in general, can benefit from being indistinct, mysterious. I don't mean abstract, but I mean is it's not all there. You have to search and imagine rather than see it straight off. I think that, I mean, for me, that's probably the thing that distinguishes art that's important and art that matters and art that's mattered to me um, from what, for want of a better word, I will I'll call illustration, um, which is there's something to contribute. The reader in, in good writing, in visual arts, it's that moment where you as the audience feel like you're bringing something of yourself yeah. to what you're seeing to help unlock it, to help interpret it, to help figure out what this is, what it means to you. And then there's pieces of art that you see that just feel like they're, they're finished there there isn't anything to figure out um it's all there for you and you can look at it and see everything and then you turn the page 
and it doesn't linger. Or you can see everything, but realize you're only showing, being seeing a little bit. Yes, it's the same. It is. The mysteries, uh, the, the Sacheveril Sitwell, Edith Sitwell's brother, said, it is the mystery that lingers and not the explanation. Yes. And I think that also is true for art. Um, yes. A good, a good mystery lingers. Yes. I'm going to interrupt you because we won't be able to put this out on all media because it has gone well over the hour. And oh my gosh! For that, I'm extremely we have, grateful. We might have to chop it into two sections. Absolutely, feel very, very free to go in and and. Shop. I'm talking to you is such a delight, Roger. It was, and it this was time the batteries good. haven't run down. <laughs> well, as far as you know, yes, it's still saying recording. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and it would be lovely to do it again one day and actually talk about the future and more about the creative process. But I, I love, love that, that we were talking about Scotland. <laughs> You know, I think, uh, to be honest, I think in a weird kind of way, it felt more like we were talking about the actual creative process on this call than any, because we were talking about the stuff, the building blocks, yes. the stuff that you create from is walking in Scotland, it is bears coming down to drink and deers headbutting people because they're not getting fed. It's that's all the stuff that it sits there in the background and when you need it and you need to create an image you need to create a story it's there for you and and i love that that was what we were talking about it yeah, wasn't just too. waffle because i think for me understanding the choreography of a pathway is like a narrative experience. It is full of stories and adventure and amazing events. I think the, the idea of a journey as a story. Yes, well, of course, um, so many you know, are. And, and then you get into Bruce Chatwin and the song lines, and it almost doesn't matter for me, you know, since Chapman died, people have pointed at the song lines and said, yeah, he's, he's very unreliable. The stuff he might have made up, the stuff he's misquoted. And it's like, yes, because he was a storyteller. And he really is telling stories here. He is not on oath in any of his books. <laughs> um, but, but there is that, but he does some, say something that feels very true, which is journeys can be stories and that traveling people and you know go back 50,000 years and we were all traveling people had the stories that the journeys became it's funny actually i was having a conver conversation with somebody about um murder on the orient express and i said the, what what is so disappointing for me is it was made by people who didn't love the train mm -hmm. It's, uh, yes, no, I, I, I understand that so completely. I used to do this thing of, um, I would go to San Diego Comic Convention, which was not fun for me. I was, I was it was like being the Beatles for three days and it's no fun being the Beatles. Um, Sorry. My, what I would ask them for um, is instead of flying me in to San Diego, from Minneapolis, I take the train and it will be a three day train journey there and a three day train journey back. And I'd get work done and I would, especially coming back, I would decompress and I would actually get the feeling of traveling through landscape after landscape and watching the world change and watching America happen. Um, Trains. And going, this, this is such a, uh, this is the most important bit for me. 
anyway. Roger, so good talking to you and I hope we can do it again. Yes, I do too. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you for oh. so much, Diane. Thank, Thank you. you. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.